All right, ma'am, you're good to go. All right. So I tried to figure out how to eliminate these pop-ups all day, and I don't know how to do that. But again, um, I am Danielle Lynch. I'm excited to spend some time with you and share this space. Uh, for those who choose to participate, this isn't necessarily a safe space, uh, but it's more so a brave space. So I want you to feel like you can engage and ask questions, share examples. Um, but I also want you to be mindful that it is being recorded. Um, and that uh, you may hurt someone's feelings. So um, again, brave space, participate, um, have an open mindset so that you can learn something. I too am trying to learn just as this is my first time on GoToMeeting and I didn't realize it. So I'll give you a little bit um, about me. Um, so I'm including my pronouns as she, her, and hers. And if that is something that's new for you, if you see that and you're wondering why people have that there, it's not necessarily um, for me because you know I identify I'm I'm born as a, uh, a female by sex by sex, um, and so I, I identify with my assigned gender for lack of um, a better term. But when I put she, her, and hers, someone else who may um, have um, a space where they feel like they need for people to identify them um, as they may present different or they want it to be very clear. They might have they, their, or them, or he, her, uh, he, her, or she, or they might say, I don't have any, or I, you know, it, it can be whatever. So when people see that you are aware, um, they sometimes feel more comfortable in talking to you. So that is, that is the sole reason for that. Um, I think, I want to say it's Indeed might have a commercial going right now where they use um, that example where there is a transgender woman that is coming in for a job interview and she sits down and the man says, my name is George and my pronouns are he, his, he, his, and him. And then he says, would you like to share your pronouns? And then the person I believe says they and them. So I'm a former collegiate and professional term used loosely athlete. Um, I'm an LGBTQ NCAA Team 1 facilitator, and I am Penn State Harrisburg NCAA Athletic Diversity and Inclusion designee. Um, I work within bystander in intervention, uh, student athlete welfare, a variety of things. Um, green Dot and also oh, I already read that part to you. I have a BA. I have a BA in anthropology and geography, and a master's um, in science for education. I am finishing up my doctorate in lifelong learning in adult education with the thesis focus on the lived experiences of black professional male athletes in light of the current social justice movements. Um, excuse me for one second. Olivia is calling me. Can you maybe give her a call? My daughter is not home yet from field hockey, so she's calling me. All right, a bit more about me. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister. As I mentioned, I'm a collegiate and professional coach. Um, I'm an activist, I'm an educator, I'm a facilitator. Um, the theory that <laughs> I uh, use, which is so controversial now, and I was a critical race theorist before it became you know, a topic to be talked about, and I'm a social scientist, um, and I'm a lifelong learner. Um, so I'm a biracial woman uh, that identifies as a black woman and within black culture. I celebrate black culture. Um, goals for this session, we wanna create a space of acceptance and celebration for all through love, tolerance, introspection, and action. Um, okay, so there's a picture of my mother <laughs> and my son who is now turning nine in two weeks. And they were at a Black Lives Matter rally in New Jersey. Um, and this this will be a, a bit of a story. So uh, my mother said, people are not going to look at you and I and treat us the same way. They view you as black and me as white. So this is a quote from my mother, who is a German immigrant. Um, she said this to me after I was berated and accused of stealing as a child. I was likely under five in a local at a local corner store in 1980s New Jersey. Um, and then I put side note at the bottom, uh, the first uh, black women gained the right to vote 15 years before I was born. So that was throughout the US. 
Um, so very bizarre circumstance. Um, oftentimes, and this is something we can ask um, as we get further into the training, like when did you realize that race was a thing and we, we weren't all just people? And my um, recollection is when I was this little kid, my mom pretty much said, you know, this also tells you how old I am. She gave me five pennies <laughs> and there was penny candy. So I could go and get five pieces of candy. And that was part of the lesson. Like you have five pennies, you know, there are one penny each. How many can you get? So I'm over there. I selected my five candy pieces of candy and I'm actively consuming them. When the store clerk keeper, whatever, came by with like a broom and was like, hey, hey thief, you know, get out of here. What? And my mom is like, whoa, what are you doing? Like, this is my kid. And the corner store guy's like, oh, I thought she was stealing. You know, um, so that's when we had to have this conversation. Um, <laughs> I don't know when it was for my brother when he was first um, introduced to difference, but my mother told me a story about my brother's older than me. Um, told me a story about uh, when he was a baby, he was being dropped off at uh, in-home daycare um, in Germany. I think that's more along the line of how things work. You know, you find someone within your community that stays at home and takes in kids and watches them while you go to work. So all week long, my mom's dropping off and picking up my brother. My brother is lighter than me. He's fairer than me. Um, and on the last day, my dad has to pick him up because my mom is working late. And my dad goes to the house and rings the bell to pick up his son. And the woman's like, can I help you? And he's like, I'm here to pick up my son, you know, Dwayne. And the woman's like, we don't have any black children here. <laughs> and my dad's like, that's my son right there. And she's like, and my brother's like, you know, responding to seeing his dad. And um, so when my mom went to drop Dwayne off the next Monday, the woman wouldn't answer the door. So these are examples. I mean, he was obviously a baby and too young to understand all of that. But um before we get into the goals of this, actually, let's do that. Goals of the session. So we want to maintain an open and growth mindset. We want to learn something new. We want to engage with each other. So again, I can't see you all right now. Um, I think I have to stop sharing so that I can, and I will in a moment, because if we are still a small, intimate group, I definitely want to hear you all. I want to meet you all. I want to learn about you. Um, we want to challenge our meaning making. So we want to challenge why we think the way that we do. Um, and we want to critically, ex critically assess what we accept as okay, standard, or normal. Um, and then we want to leave with a best practice. We want to leave with something that we have learned. Uh, we want to contribute to the solution to make our world a better place for future. And we want to figure out what our superpower is and how we can employ it. So I think if I do stop sharing for now and escape and go back to you here, I'll hopefully get to meet you. So there are seven of you here. Um, well, Rick, I already know. I don't know if you're participating or not, but I would love for you all, if it is safe, to here, yes, show, me, show me your face. And um, how about this? Tell me something. Show me your face, introduce yourself, and tell me something about you that I would not know from looking at you. Hmm. Uh, Sandra, are you volunteering to go first? Uh, what <laughs> are, you, are you volunteering to go first i was saying uh, you can introduce yourself and then well we would need to see your face for this can you show All us right. your face sure i was just uh on this time hey that's it well that's not a hat that's a ceiling fan that's me oh you know what we don't see a picture it just shows your initials i wonder uh, if we troubleshoot that oh there you are yeah i can see you there she is Awesome. So can you, um, you know, tell us your name, obviously we can see it, um, but then can you tell us something about yourself that you wouldn't know just by looking at you? And I'll come up with one while you think, and the rest of the group can think about that as well. Um, something you would not know about me, and I'm just kind of thinking about this on the spot as well. <coughs> so I am... Okay. A semi-avid birder. That's something you wouldn't necessarily know by looking at me. So, Sandra, are you ready to roll? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. What are you going to tell us? Uh, well, um, my name is there, Sandy Levine. I'm 58. I'm a paramedic for a lot of years, coming back into the field. A lot of people who know me 
probably don't know this, but um, uh, I used to play semi-pro softball. Okay. What position? Uh, first base catcher. Okay. Oh, lefty. That was pretty impressive, they say. But it wasn't really semi-pro. It was just really advanced, organized. I wouldn't, like, they, you want to, it was tournament ball in the okay. Southwest, you know, like New Mexico, Vegas, uh, Arizona, yes. California a couple of times. So it wasn't really, you know, it was more Southwest regional stuff. Okay, cool. Call it what you want. Yeah. Got another athlete on here. All right, who else is, is going to hop on? Who's going to be brave? <laughs> I don't know who caller one is. That that's the one I really want to know. Oh, you don't have a camera. Okay, so we can't even really guess then. Anyway, um, Jackie, can you share uh, something that we wouldn't know about you? And I don't know if you know other folks on the call, even if it's in the group chat. Most everyone knows me, but do they, is there anything they don't know about you? Uh, hmm. Okay. Well, while she's thinking, what about Nate or Ashley? Because I don't want to hold you all up with the icebreaker. Ashley's one of the ones that went on the call. Hey, Nate. Here's DJ, okay. Here's DJ Master. Hey. Good evening. Uh, I'm Nate. I'm a paramedic for the past 11 years. And I played in the Junior Olympics for soccer for four years straight. Okay. Awesome. Woo! <laughs> That's wonderful. And Ashley's on the call. And did Jackie put anything in yet? No. Okay. What about you, Rick? <coughs> anything? Uh, me? Uh, <laughs> I've been involved in EMS for 32 years. Um, prior to becoming a paramedic, I went to school to become an aircraft mechanic. Uh, okay. I, um, I uh, had plans to go to medical school, but organic chemistry proved to be a greater foe than I expected. <laughs> yeah, that orgo will kill you. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Jackie got one. She attended La Costa. Posesha, our bilingual church service. Okay, awesome. So, I mean, part of this exercise is to show that we, you know, we are more than what appears. Like when you meet someone, there's more to them. So we need to dig a little bit deeper and go beyond um, maybe first impressions without, you know, getting to know folks. So that was the point of that. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen so that we can get through the presentation. Oh, you wanted to go, okay, so Jackie wanted to go into forensic medicine. I have a few friends that have done that. So Rick, can you tell me if you are seeing my screen? Not yet. Not yet, you're not seeing it, okay. So let me go back, share, screen, share. Yeah. Ah, now you are, now you can see me. All right, so we should be in presentation mode. Oh, it's going to make me go back every time. That's not going to be any fun. All right, so we're going to go through a couple of definitions um, just so we're kind of on the same page. We got a bunch of them. I may skip some of them. Um, but to start, I always start with prejudice and racism. And again, this is from the critical race theory background. So you can tell all your friends that you met a critical race theorist and she was actually OK. So uh, prejudice is an unfavorable opinion or feeling formed beforehand without knowledge, thought, or reason. Any preconceived opinion or feel feeling, either favorable or unfavorable, unreasonable feelings, opinions, or attitudes, especially of a hostile nature regarding an ethnic, racial, social, or religious group. And the difference between being prejudiced and being racist from a critical race theory background is the addition of power. So racism is prejudice with power. So someone can dislike you because you wear teal on Tuesdays, but if they can't do anything that affects your life other than dislike you because you wear a teal on Tuesdays, 
then you're just prejudiced against that person with their teal wearing self on Tuesdays. Now, if you have the power to eliminate that person wearing teal on Tuesday from getting a job or getting an education or getting a fair trial, that is race. That would be racism of the <laughs> of the teal uh, derivation. It would be in this case. So race is a construct without a biological meaning. It's a way that we group people. It's something that was created. So systemic racism, which is also called structural or institutional racism, deals with systems, um, systems and structures that um, have procedures and processes that disadvantage African-Americans. And I actually just want to change this to black people because not all black people in America are African-American. That's a whole other a whole nother conversation. We all know what hate is. Um, I think we all know what a bigot is, somebody who's intolerant. Uh, towards people who are different from them. So privilege, we are gonna spend some time um, in privilege a little bit later on. Um, so I won't go into that too deeply. Um, so diversity, everyone thinks we've got a black person, we are diverse. We've got a woman, we are diverse. No, no, no. So diversity is the state of being diverse. It's having variety. It's having people with all types of abilities, people who are dis disabled, people who are um, Asian, white, black, Hispanic, short, tall, um, visually impaired, whatever. Um, so being diverse does not mean having inclusion either because you can say, okay, we are now officially diverse. We have people from all over the place, old, young, short, tall, but if they don't have a say, if they don't have a seat at the table, which is what's being used a lot right now, then you don't have inclusion. So inclusion is the action or state of including, um, including them in the group. So somebody described it as this, like having diversity is inviting folks to a dance. We're inviting you to our dance. So now we're there, we have a diverse dance, we have all kinds of people there. Having inclusion is saying to everyone, what do you want to hear? What music do you want to dance to? And then that being included. That way everyone, it's, it's throughout the cultural, it's culture, it's throughout the experience. So here's a buzzword. I, I didn't know what biopic meant. I thought it was some type of film. I had to be schooled by a, a, a younger person. So it's an acronym for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. We know what community is. We don't have to get into that. So colorism is one that we may not know in this group. Um, so it's prejudice or discrimination against individuals with dark skin tone, but it's within the same ethnic group. So that um, colorism is often found in black communities or um, in Indian communities, anywhere where there is a range of hue for blackness. Um, yeah, well, that's all my husband's adding in Latino or Latinx. Yeah, it, it can be found there as well. But that's that's also black, uh, Afro Latina. Anyway, so intersectionality is one of the frameworks that I am uh, using for my study. So in short, it's the idea that um, if you look at me and you say she's a biracial woman, she's 41 years old, she's a coach she likely has the same experiences as every 41 year old biracial woman who is a coach. Absolutely not, because there's so many other factors that come into play. Those are those social categorizations of race, class, gender, um, and you know how I came up, my sexuality, all of those different pieces intersect to make me who I am. So we can't, we can't label a group of people like, these are Hispanic people and they feel this way, or these are white people and they feel this way. Intersectionality shows that we each have our own identity. Now there might be some commonalities and overlapping themes, but we are still independent of each other. Um, so marginalization, so that can be of a group or of a person or of a concept. Um, that's treating groups, people, or concepts as if they are insignificant or at the periphery. Oppression is prolonged, cruel, and unjust treatment or control. And a lot of the control piece is what we're talking about um, in the US. Anti-racist is a buzzword. It's not equity and inclusion. It uh, centers around action and the act of dismantling racism. So it can be more than anti-racist. It can be like anti-gay, anti-homophobic, um, anti-whatever. Um, so. Bias is prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, group compared with another. 
in an unfair way. We're going to talk about microaggressions later. I won't uh, get into it here. Stereotype is kind of what we were talking about with intersectionality, the idea that not everyone is the same. The other piece with intersectionality, I'm using it in a way that is, is actually frowned upon right now. It is really used in black feminist um, theory, but it's being used across the board for, for everyone to kind of understand it in a different way, but that is, that is where its home is. So stereotype is a widely held, uh, but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. So the people that live in this part of Lancaster are this way. Well, well, I met one that's not, hey, I did too. So it's a stereotype about an area. Um, heteronormative, heteronormative is denoting or relating to a worldview that promotes heterosexuality as the norm. So hetero is um, the sex part of it and normative is what is norm. So heteronormative um, can, can be the same, not for hetero, but like um, religion. Like people can say, well, we're a Catholic uh, community. We're a, you know, and that's the way it should be and I don't like anything else. So an advocate is a person who publicly supports and recommends a particular case or cause or policy. An ally um, works to combine or unite uh, resources, commodities uh, for mutual benefit for everyone. That's the equality piece. Discernment is the ability to judge and this is what I want you all to do. You need to be able to judge and think and critique some of your own thoughts. I, I go through it daily. So covering, you might um, experience this within the workplace. So covering is not sharing who you really are and how you identify because you're concerned about negative interactions. So if you are a, um, if you're a transgender person or if you're a gay person and you don't want people in your business because you're scared that it's gonna affect the hours that you get, who you get to work with, how much money you, you make, then you cover. So you just act like you are like everyone else. Um, Cultural appropriation is the adoption of an element or elements of one culture or identity by members of another culture or identity. Uh, the, the negative way of saying that is culture vulture. You're a culture vulture. So gaslighting is manipulating someone by psychological means into questioning their own sanity. So they're giving you firm examples of how they're being treated poorly. And then you say, oh, it can't be that bad. You know, that's just one case. That's one example. Um, I don't know that we're really going to get into much of this, but nativism originating or occurring naturally in a particular place uh, or native supremacy is the state or condition of being superior to all others in authority, power or status. Nationalism, uh, identification with one's own nation and support for its interests, especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. White nationalism, one group, uh, sorry, one of a group of militant whites who espouse white supremacy and advocate enforced racial segregation. So originalism came into this um, when we were talking about um, one of the justices that was uh, going to be, that was being decided upon. And originalism is a type of judicial interpretation of the constitution, our constitution, that aims to follow it as it would have been understood at the time that it was written. And you, I get into not debates, they're really just conversations with folks where I'm like, do you think that the founding fathers of our country understood what an assault rifle would become? <laughs> like, I don't think they knew all of that. So that's where we need to, you know, maybe think about it a little bit differently. Indigenous originating or occurring naturally in a particular place, again, um, native. Uh, diaspora, so this is why I wanted to talk about changing, um, the word African-American throughout my presentation, because the more I hear about this and African diaspora might help to explain it. So African diaspora is the term used to describe the mass dispersion of people from Africa during the transatlantic slave trade from the 1500s to the 1800s. This diaspora took millions of people from Western and Central Africa to different regions throughout the Americas and the Caribbean. Does anybody know, and you can just yell it out again, because I can't see your faces. Does anybody know where the largest group of black people are outside of Africa, like within the world? North America, South America, um, Asia, anybody know?
I think I it's think the Caribbean. The Caribbean? So you're close. It's actually South America. It's Brazil. So the largest group of black people outside of um, Africa is Brazil. And then the Caribbean has a, a good amount as well, but then it's, it's the US and UK. Um, so colonial mentality is the internalized attitude of ethnic or cultural inferiority felt by people as a result of colonization um, or colonialization. Colonization is what I meant to write. Um, corresponds with the belief that the cultural values of the colonizer are inherently superior to one's own, used to describe the generational impact of co colonialization on the psychology of colonialized people and their descendants. It has been used more recently in psychology or in psychological study to account for instances of collective depression, anxiety, and other widespread mental health issues in populations that have experienced colonialism, colonialization. Ableism is discrimination in favor of able-bodied able people. So that we kind of jumped there a bit because all of that is a part of it. So how do we learn to identify and move past our own inherent bias? Um, we need to understand the historical foundation of our country. We need to honestly assess and address privilege. We need to critically reflect and think about our experiences and the experiences of others. Why do we feel the way we do? How do our beliefs keep us in positions of power and others oppressed? How do our beliefs keep us uh, keep up oppressed? Keep us oppressed and others in power. That's a typo. Um, we want to have the goal of being mindful of the experiences of marginalized or oppressed people. We want to become all the antis, what I was talking about before, anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-transphobic, anti-homophobic, anti-xenophobic. And we want to explore our microaggressions. We're not going to do this. <laughs> We're not going to go through all of American history. I thought about it, but um, I'm not sure that we'll have enough time. <laughs> um, and this is a quote from a famous author and playwright, to be African-American is to be African without any memory and to be American without any privilege. What I can share from the previous slide, well, let me do that. All of these pieces from 1619 all the way up until today have kind of set the stage for where we're at as a country in terms of um, divide or coming together or um, deficiencies in different spaces. So does anybody wanna talk about any of these? Cause I'm happy to go into it, but I'm not sure that you all wanna hear from my dissertation writing. So I'm waiting for- Yes. You do want to- some... Yes, I do. Okay, any particular- I, I no, I would like to go back to gaslighting, a better definition or a more complete definition of that. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that I'm completely speaking of gaslighting in this piece, but um, did, did you have a different definition of gaslighting? No, I just never knew what it was. And I, the way you described it seems not such a big deal. Well, yeah. They it's made to feel that way. So um, I don't know that I have any specific examples, but um, I mean, one one example could be, <laughs> I was talking with some folks that I grew up with, um, same town, completely different experiences. When I was in college, I used to work a late night job at um, a catering hall. And I would drive to this catering hall during the day. I'm in a penguin suit, tuxedo, passing out hors d'oeuvres, that sort of thing. Clean up, get everything set for the next day. I'm coming home probably around one o'clock in the morning and I would get stopped by the same police officers <laughs> um, until they figured out, oh, it's just her. And my colleagues did not have that same experience. And I'm saying, well, why do you think that is? What's the difference between, and we, I think we both were driving the same car. I'm like, my lights work, your lights work. What's the difference? Why do I keep getting stopped? Is it the color of my car? Is it the color of your car? You know, like what are the differences? 
and the people I'm working with are like, oh, it's definitely it's not anything about your your race. It's it's just that you're catching them at a bad time, or maybe you're speeding, or maybe so it's it's when you have like repeated proof of something negative happening to you and someone telling you, hey, that there's no way. Ah yes. There's no I understand. Okay, good. Thank you for asking. Are there any other questions? Because I can't see you all again. So just shout it out if you have. <sighs> Awesome. Okay. So now we're going to talk about privilege and you know what? First we're going to do, let me escape out of here. And I found this. It's better when you do it in, in person, um, but we're going to do it. We're going to watch the video of it. Oh, you know what? Swipe up, no down. Smell like a real I, champ. Let champ. me know if Make you can't hear. Some people are born into families where they have to walk miles just to get water. All I have to do is turn on a faucet. That's privilege. If you have ever tried to change your speech, if you were embarrassed about your clothes, or how if you've never think twice about calling this I think privilege is when um, some people have some things and other people don't have things. And I feel privilege is something that you don't even really have control over. I think it'd be silly for me to say I don't have a fair amount of privilege, considering like the country I live in and the job I get to do and the college I was allowed to go to. I suppose being a white male will help me end up somewhere toward the front, but I'll take a few steps back from being gay. I don't think I'll make it to the front. I think I'll maybe be in the middle. That's just the gut feeling I have. If your parents work nights and weekends to support your family, take one step back. If you can show affection for your romantic partner in public without fear of ridicule or violence, take one step forward. If you are embarrassed about your clothes or house while growing up, take one step back. If you have ever been diagnosed as having a physical or mental illness or disability, take one step back. If you've ever been bullied or made fun of based on something you can't change, take one step back. If you get time off for your religious holidays, take one step forward. If you came from a supportive family environment, if you can see a doctor whenever you feel the need, if you're able to move through the world without fear if of you sexual took out loans for your education, there were more than 50 books in your house burning. So these are your final positions. I think it felt kind of strange for everyone. It's a hard thing to discuss or even reflect on. It was very awkward. I think when you can represent it so visually like this and so immediately, it definitely takes on a new form. Oh, uh, I think we were like all joking around in the beginning. It was pretty lighthearted. And as soon as the questions started coming in, the mood shifted immediately. And we all kind of, it was just silent. Just looking back and seeing like a bunch of people behind you is not a good feeling. It's like weird how you want to like hold on to explaining a certain privilege. Like, oh, but that's not actually me. Cause like I had to work really hard for that. So it's, it's weird to like take a step forward when you feel like you're taking a step forward with someone else, but you wear a lot of the baggage of like how those things are hard. It was like more emotional than I thought it would be. It reminded me of when they talk about slavery in high school and you feel like angry for a few days, but then you just realize like, this is how it is. For me, it was kind of frustrating almost to look back and see how much further some people were behind me and realizing that, you know, a lot of that stuff, no amount of hard work or even legislation can make up that gap. It's, it's interesting being an Asian American because you kind of, you're not really sure where you fall on the spectrum. I know that for me, the, one of the reasons I ended up so far back was that there are questions around safety as an African American, as a woman, as a, as a gay woman. Um, there are just so many different ways that I don't feel safe. I feel like I just learned to be grateful for what you have. You know, we're in such a huge society where it's always complaining about what you don't have. It just shows you that for some families, like each family, you're meant to do better. My grandparents did good. My parents did good and I'll do even better. I, I do think if you're not like aware of privilege, you should do this exercise, but it's more complicated. And part of the reason why it's more complicated is because through this exercise, 
what it continues to do is like alienate and make people feel it make people recognize especially the ones that are in the back they're further like subjected to being in the back so be careful if you do that that's the, the little caveat that i will put on that um so we can continue please don't make me start all over again will it let me start from here anybody super great at this if it's it um it should um allow you where where it says uh slideshow to your left the ribbon up on top where it says slideshow and it should ask you from current slide boss all right okay so do i have privilege and the answer for all of the us in some case is going to be yes you likely do so let me tell you about mine so we were talking about colorism earlier so being um a black woman that is lighter skinned i have the privilege of of being lighter skinned and being closer to whiteness which is what is perceived as normative and the ideal in many people's eyes i also am able-bodied i'm also heterosexual i'm also college educated um i'm also athletic so i i could go on and on and on i have a parent that graduated from college um, I'm married. So all of those pieces make up my privilege. Um, so this is a lot of discussion surrounding what makes up the privilege. We can kind of go through it as quickly as possible so that we can get some more stuff in. But by exploring our privileged identities, we can enhance our personal development, improve our relations with other people and become better citizens of the world. Our various social identities, which we talked about earlier, sex, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, age, socioeconomic class, religion and ability among others are important aspects of ourselves that shape our attitudes, behaviors, worldviews and experiences. As we work to create and participate in diverse and democratic environments, we need to understand how our own and others' identities and related social locations affect our lives and our interactions with each other. So microaggressions. Okay, well, how do we inherit by how do inherit biases show up in our everyday lives? Microaggressions, I keep advertising, we're gonna get to it, I promise. Assumptions and stereotypes, we talked a bit about that earlier. Wow, you're so tall, you must play basketball. You know, it, it can be the small things like that. Um, when we fail to critically reflect on things that we learned as children, those biases showed up. Things that your grandparents taught you, things that your parents taught you, that you took on to believe as fact. That's how bias shows up. Favoring those who look like us and hiring friendships and decision-making. So I sit on almost every hiring committee that I feel they can stick me on. And they say, we need to hire the best candidate. And oftentimes, based on our own biases, we're like, that best candidate looks like me, but it doesn't look like me. It looks like everyone else who's in the room. So we're hiring more of the same. That's how our inherent bias shows up. Asking intrusive questions or presumptive questions about personal experiences of marginalized people. Bias shows up there. When we fail to have compassion for the experiences of marginalized groups, we instill the dominant culture and silence the voices of the oppressed. Normalizing and standardizing white, male, Christian, and heteronormati heteronormativity as the dominant or overarching narrative reinforces bias and creates a space where diverse individuals may not feel welcomed or comfortable. So I do have a video for microaggressions. I'm not sure where it is, we'll see. So micro, microaggressions are the kinds of remarks, questions, or actions that are painful because they happen outside, it, okay. They have, because they have to do with a person's membership to a group that's discriminated against um, or subject to stereotype. And further, um, they happen outside of the offender's conscious space. So they're not aware that they're saying or asking something that is causing harm. They don't intend for it to cause harm, but it does. Um, it's a form of implicit bias. It may appear as a compliment or a joke. Um, and again, they occur uh, because they are outside the level of conscious awareness of the perpetrator. 
Did I explain that okay? I know I got a little jumbled. Are there any questions about that? Okay, yes, I do have one. I do have a video. Let's see if this actually will work on here. Let me know if nothing plays for you. Uh, become a member to watch this video. What? Why didn't it play before? It played before for me. It won't do it now? Ah, that's too bad. Let me see if it will change. No, it still won't. Okay, so we won't do that. We'll use we'll use the examples that I have. So what that what that did it pretty much showed you in Hollywood movies that are popular um, microaggressions that happen all the time and we just kind of accept them. I think that the go to meeting must not allow that certain app certain um, apps will not allow me to play YouTube videos. All right, so back to microaggressions. An Asian American student is complimented by a professor for speaking perfect English, but it's actually his first language, ouch. A black man notices that a white woman flinches and clutches her bag as she sees him in the elevator she's about to enter, and it, he is painfully reminded of racial stereotypes. Someone saying things like, you're so beautiful, what are you mixed with? You can't just be so black, you, I'm sorry, you can't just be black, you speak so well, you're so articulate. Attempting to touch a person's hair or skin without permission. So I have a story for you um, that is not gonna be as good as the video, but it's still pretty interesting. So as COVID restrictions are lifting, um, I had my hair in a style that's called a faux lock. So it is a hair extension for lack of a better term. Um, and I had full locks and I'm going into um, the wine and spirits to get a bottle of wine and a bottle of champagne. I believe this was in preparation for New Year's. And they have all the plastic around. So like you're protecting the person who's working, you're protecting yourself. And this woman who's working comes around the plastic barricade with her hands reached out. So I put my bottles of wine into her hands because I'm like, what? Is, and she goes, oh, I wanted to touch your hair. And I'm like, first of all, it's COVID. Secondly, why would you feel like you have permission to touch a stranger's person, body, hair, whatever? Well, I wanted to see how it felt and I wanted to see if it was real. And I was just like, my goodness, please just check me out. So that is a lived microaggression that happened recently. We'll continue. Telling a woman she's bossy. Um, so it demeans a woman's leadership and management skills. Again, saying you're so articulate to a person of color makes the assumption that people of color cannot be articulate. So this person must be unique and special. That's actually an insult. It's not a compliment. Scheduling important deadlines on religious or cultural holidays. So, um, or around religious um, or cultural holidays. So it communicates that the prioritization of American dominant holidays, 4th of July, Christmas, uh, Columbus Day, those are exclusively like the ones that are a part of our culture, our American culture. And it does not include other folks that make up our American culture that may not celebrate those same holidays. Claiming that you have OCD because you're organized, that minimizes the experiences of people who are actually struggling with OCD. Asking questions such as, where are you from? No, where are you really from? Assumes that someone was not born in the US um, and makes them feel like an outsider. Uh, calling someone he or she without knowing their preferred pronouns, um, you're risking that you are offending them. So that's why in the beginning I started that way to say, hey, these are my pronouns. Um, and that's again, a microaggression because you're not intending to insult the person, you just don't know. Okay, so can I make this any bigger? I might need you again, Rick. Or we can just skip it. So this is a gender bred person, it talks about the brain uh, having identity, the heart having attraction, and the sex uh, being either you're born with or the expression of all of those things together. This is how I explained to folks when I was having a conversation about Caitlyn Jenner and someone was saying, okay, so Bruce is now a, a transgender woman, so he's gay, that means that he wants to be with guys 
And I said, no. So gender identity and sexuality are two different things. Bruce, who is now Caitlin, felt as though they were a woman. So they are going to continue to date women. <laughs> and then the person said, I don't know how much money in the world someone has to be able to do all of that. If you're going to be dating the same women that you were dating before, what difference does it make? And I'm like, it's not about sex. It's about identity. <laughs> so did, did that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about sexuality and gender identity and how they're different things? Danielle, Danielle. I, you do? I, I do. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Did someone? Did I? Did I walk on somebody? I apologize if I did. I didn't. Uh, does somebody have something else other than me? Now I don't know. Just going off your uh, Jenner discussion here. One of the things that um, I teach, because I teach EMTs and paramedics, is mm -hmm. um, the confusion that some providers may have when it comes to the medical necessity, the medical necessity of whether or not someone identifies as a certain gender versus as what they actually are. Because I, I, you know, I have no qualms with identifying with anything, but in the emergency medicine, we have a very distinct issue that may occur if you have someone who is male but is identifying as female and the provider doesn't dig deep into that. And let's say that individual is complaining of abdominal pain. Right. Uh, you show up to the ER. And the individual who's identifying as a female, but in reality, unless someone, you know, takes that step and, you know, almost offends someone by, by what you're the standard that is being laid down. Now we have, an, we have the potential for uh, medical liability for either doing something to someone to rule things out. Because if any female of a birthing age comes in, with abdominal pain or requiring any x-rays, that individual is getting a pregnancy test. Right. Or if you have a, you know, a female uh, or a male, which is um, identifying or whatnot, we end up having, G, um, you know, um, gender specific uh, signs and symptoms that goes on. So I think while, you know, we, you know, especially when it comes to the gender issue, um, how someone identifies, even if they've transitioned, uh, depending on the, the, the completeness of the transition, does have ramifications for us pre-hospital if the provider is not comfortable in asking those questions. So while there is a gender-bred person, that's and, and you know that's understandable. There are um, there are legal and uh, medical ramifications in individuals who do not feel comfortable or do not understand the full concepts of what is going on here. Um, I mean, this is why I think your jobs are so crucial and important. Um, I'm not sure if you can create even a script that says, and I'm sure there are transgender uh, EMTs that might say. Um, I, I'm not sure what your script is when you approach a person that, you know, you might have this situation with, but you might say, Hey, my name is Danielle. Um, I'm an EMT that's here to help you. Um, my pronouns are she, uh, her and his, however, I, I am a male or I have uh, male parts. Can, can you let me know, you know, and kind of open the door that way. Um, I don't know if you can use that for everyone or if you can use language like, is there a possibility of pregnancy or um, are you, you know, you're, you're in a tough spot. So you want to be respectful of the person so you can call them by whatever they want to be called, Jim, Taylor, Danielle or Rick. But, you know, you at the end of the day have to get to business to understand how you can best provide care. So my approach is more so your toward that and you accept that there's people that are that you think that could be or not the way that them. If you have the attitude of providing care and showing that, listen, I'm not here to judge you. I simply want to care for you. Please provide me with this information so I can better care for you. Um, I mean, I could help to maybe come up with some language for that specifically. If you're interested in that, I, I would love to, to help you with that. 
question. What do you think? That's that's always one of the things because you know my medic class. You know, I we debate this all the time, and and you know having the, the you know the the biology background. I I you know when when again maybe it's me just being stupid, but I always say, look, your X Y X you know X Y X X. You know, in the field, I look, I respect everything that you need to be or whatever. But at this point, I need to know. What does your mom call you? What do you know with that? You know, it, but listen, your mom, the mom might still call uh, her Michaela, but she might be Michael and taking um, hormones. And that mom, I understand that it's, you know? it's it's one of those things. Nate, um, Greg, you guys are out in the field a lot, lot, lot more than I am. Have you come across this, Sandy? You're you're out there too. I mean, with the CPs, do you guys come across this? Typically, when we get a referral um, to meet somebody post post hospitalization, it's usually a, they'll let us know um, how the person wants to be addressed. So it makes it a little bit easier for us on the post-hospital. Pre-hospitally, in my experience, and I, 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 this might be as simplified as possible, but if you treat everybody with dignity and respect, it doesn't yes. matter what they are underneath, what, 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 what body parts they have. It, it just comes down to dignity and respect, and yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that will always win. I think that I, I think that's you know with without seeing that right up front, I think that's that's that 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 is prima facie right on front right there. It has to be. Um, I mean, you you most of all. I mean, how many years did you spend in Brooklyn? You know, oh, I was in the Bronx, but I worked in Manhattan. I'm sorry, and in Manhattan, <laughs> I'm from the Bronx, but I worked in Harlem for 11 years, and and you know, yeah. You, Here's the thing, I got to tell you, you can have 10 paramedics or pre-hospital care providers at any level from 10 different states in the United States, and I can guarantee you they can share the same stories with the same type of individuals, and you'll get 10 different ways they dealt with it, and it all had a good, because they treated, they were professionals, and everything got treated with dignity and respect, and because of that, you know, you learn from it. You know, that's how you know what the pronoun should be. Oh, now I know. Because right. you treated them with dignity and respect. Right. And if someone mm -hmm. is if someone is transgender and you say, um, are you transgender? And they're in, in an emergent need, they'll probably respect the fact that you're thinking of that instead of potentially judging them. And listen, if you're wrong, that's okay too. You're still there to provide care. And, you know, like you were sharing, um, I think that was Sandra, you can't see, um, treating people with dignity and respect opens the door and not making assumptions yes. about them based on, you know, what they look, what they look like, what you think about, you know, their choice in doing whatever, you know, treat people with dignity and respect and it, it'll make things a lot smoother. Amen. Anything else on the topic? I, I know you said Nate. Did Nate want to respond? I don't want to cut anything. Nate, All right, then I'm going to move forward. Okay, so then we're going to talk about inclusion. We talked about inclusion in terms of the definition before, but what does inclusion really mean? Um, so inclusion, as I was talking about with the dance before, it's providing the music to all of the people that are there and uh, want to be included. Um, it's thinking about your language, just as we were talking about now. So language can be inclusive or exclusive. Um, instead of saying guys, you can say colleagues, teammates, team. I use the term beautiful people when I'm working with my student athletes. They laugh at me. Um, I never assume anyone is... Um, heterosexual um, or gay or anything else. I just, you know, I, I speak with respect to everyone. I talk about, you know, dating violence as it pertains to uh, heterosexual, gay, lesbian, transgender. I talk about all of it because they're gonna have a friend that is going to be connected in some space and they're gonna need some support. 
So I am there to provide that support. Okay. Um, yeah, I say beautiful people. So I'll, I'll have men and women on my starting line and I'll say beautiful people to the line or teammates to the line, go. So reviewing the descriptors of uniforms, expectations, procedures, policies to ensure that they are inclusive uh, language for best practice. So um, I'm going through our staff manuals and our student athlete manuals and there's language like ladies should dress like this for um, bus rides to compete. Men should dress like this. I'm like, we got to take all of that out and it needs to say, uh, you know, professional attire, um, not black tie. You're dressing like you're going to get a job. And that's going to be varied for different people. That's also going to be varied based on their socioeconomic status. So it's being open. It's not putting people into a box. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Being aware of those holidays that we were talking about before um, and celebrate ones that also, okay, being aware of holidays other than the ones that you celebrate to promote inclusion. So if you have folks on staff that may not celebrate Christmas, you might want to find out, you know, what they're celebrating and what specific things are happening around that. If they're fasting, um, if they're going through different things, understand it a little bit so that you can, you know, so that they can feel included in your team. Uh, understanding a holiday like Columbus Day may have adverse reactions for marginalized people. And this is one that I have less pushback um, more recently, but people really were struggling with this before. Um, so un again, it's just understanding that the person to the right or to the left of you may not feel celebratory about Christopher Columbus and understand perhaps the reasons why. Um, intentional inclusion, awareness, like we were talking about before, diet or customs, uh, time off around holidays or events that uh, marginalize or oppress populations, uh, they might have a different calendar than you do. That's the same for um, LGBTQ community. So including images of marginalized people throughout your literature and marketing and just letting people know, like I'm not sure how you all are grouped, but letting people know like everybody is welcome here like and truly mean that and support it. Um, create a space or a platform resource for the expression of marginalized people. Um, huh. So this, I mean, it would help your group. This was a slide that was more so for like I did a um, I did a session with an accounting group and they wanted data on, you know, the, the benefits of diversity. So we'll go through that. No problem. How does inclusion and diversity benefit a group success? So diversity is beautiful. It adds flavor. It adds options. Uh, it gives you a fuller experience um, and picture. Companies have reported that employees with disabilities have higher retention rates and productivity. Um, a Deloitte study found that diversity and inclusion practices made teams more effective as inclusive teams outperform their peers at 80% in team-based assessment. And when you have that diversity, you have different life experiences, you have different opinions, you're, you're covering more areas that, you know, would affect more people. Everyone benefits from diversity and inclusion. Um, how does equity benefit a group success? Equity encourages cognitive diversity in decision making. So when everyone, black, white, purple, green, male, female, old, young, gay, straight, poor, rich, when everyone is able to contribute, it raises the level of pro productivity and of thought because now we're not gonna leave out so-and-so. We're not gonna leave out this demographic because everyone is contributing. So there's a, whole, a more holistic result and everyone is taken care of. Equity enables targeted upskilling for a diverse workforce. That's pretty much the same thing that I just said in shorter, fancier language. Equity drives engagement uh, for specific employee demographics. Equity prevents dissatisfaction and ultimately employee retention. Equity equips the entire company to contribute to a shared mission. What kinds of conversations should we be having? So I, I would love to actually get some data from you all to see where you think we need to also improve in this area. So we should be having, did somebody unmute? 
Is there a, a, um, a question or a contribution? I hit it by accident. Oh, okay, all right, no problem. So we should be having conversations regarding the history of our country that is not taught, which is unfortunately critical race theory. Um, so like when you think about it, critical race theory talks about how racism is embedded in the fabric of American culture from its origin. We founded our country knowing that we were enslaving people. Um, and, and with that, <laughs> Sorry for my pop-ups. And with that, we have to understand where we are today as a result of that. So critical race theory is not divisive. It's more so educating people about things like what happened in Tulsa. You know, I didn't learn about that until I was an adult. It is- I didn't learn about that until last year when I asked my friend who's a teacher in middle school in New York, I said, why don't you teach that? Because it's not, it's not common knowledge. And the American education system is skewed and whitewashed to make people look heroic. So imagine that you are, you are a Native American child. Imagine that you're a Black child. When you learn about the history of Native Americans and about Black people, for Black people, it's you were enslaved. <laughs> for Native Americans, it was you were overtaken and massacred and put on reservation camps. It doesn't talk about like the great histories that actually were there and then the inconvenient truths that are aligned with it. So it's actually having real conversations about that and critical race theory addresses those things. Um, it doesn't just say, you know, let's, you know, let's draw, you know, the stars on the flag and the stripes. Like it, it actually talks about all of the pieces that make America what it is. What is more patriotic than being able to critically assess that you live and love and make it better? What is more patriotic than that? Um, so the more questions that we need to talk about is what is our investment in race? Because we try not to talk about it and we are in 2021 and it is coming out of every uh, corner that we find. Race is something that's not gonna go away. It's something that we have to talk about. Um, the same with, with uh, transgender folks. Like we need to talk about that stuff. We need to talk about it. it it's not gonna go away if we don't talk. And then we can, we can say, how can I be more anti-racist, phobic, anti-sexist, anti-all of that? Um, we can talk about why whiteness and heterosexual status is normative. And what can we do about that so that more people are in positions of power and more people are accepted and comfortable? Um, so now we didn't talk about, we didn't go deep, deep into privilege. Um, like normally, and we can do this if you all are comfortable. We can talk about what our privileges are, but because this is recorded, I don't know if you wanna get into all of that, but we can think about that privilege walk and we can say to ourselves, well, where do I fit into this? Uh, what privileges do I have? And with those privileges, I have a superpower. So my superpower is when um, I get hired for jobs because I'm light skinned and you know articulate and have a, a degrees, I'm gonna open the door for other women and I'm going to make sure the voices of darker skinned women are heard and appreciated and valued. Um, I'm gonna look out for them. I'm gonna look out for folks that are at the margins, folks that need a helping hand. And that's what we can all do with our different priv privileges. Same with um, heterosexual folks or people that are, um, again, I sit on all these committees and I'm listening to what the committee conversation is. And if somebody is being discriminated against because they may have Parkinson's, that's not allowed. We can't eliminate a candidate because of a physical condition, a medical condition that they have. So it's looking out for those things and not just letting it happen, not letting things just happen the way that they always did. Um, so that's how we can use our superpowers uh, to help in your community and help in your workplace. Um, and then if you have the power at an organizational level, you can talk about how you can eliminate racism and bias like through a system through a systemic way and that is the challenge that is the big challenge corporations it's very very difficult to get those types of things done again we are in the midst of a, a global reckoning how can my actions support my community that is most affected by covid by oppression 
um, and what resources can we provide? And that's key for you folks because you're on the front line seeing all types of things that I cannot even imagine. And you know, you 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 all have that. <laughs> I watched somebody break their ankle on TV and I felt sick. And I said, there's somebody who's got to care for so much worse things than this. So what other conversations should we be having that are specifically like within your world? Anything else? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll share. I'll share something that um, that I sort of um, felt a, a strong commitment to give my support to some uh, some colleagues of mine on my second job. Not not with EMS, but I work for another company, and um, and they're all uh, the majority of the folks I work with are are people of color every color <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and one of the women I work with uh, Shade, she's a um, maybe a early 30s black woman born and raised in Baltimore and uh, at, like the rest of her family and you know I know a little bit about her family and I and we don't see each other anymore we all work from home now this, so this is a different job but we all work from home and so during this whole thing with uh, George Floyd and, and her living in Baltimore and everything going on, I, I asked her if her, her, if her family was okay, you know, what can I do to support her? What can, what can I do to help her? And um, she goes, I can't believe you even asked. I said, how can I not ask, you know, uh, uh, it's, how could you not? Like, how are you doing? How is your family? Are you, are you okay? Are you safe? And um, what can I do to better support you? How can I, so what I started doing, this is what I, this is what I personally started doing. <laughs> and I, um, I don't know if it's silly. Maybe it is. I don't know. Um, I, 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 I've always considered myself a kind person and always sort of going out of my way for anybody. But I, I think I'm, I think I just find myself smiling more at everybody for, for no reason. And it's just smiling. I, I I don't know. I just I just if I see somebody, I just smile instead of thinking of my own shit. I, I don't know. I yeah. I don't, I don't even know how to make a difference. I, I I really don't. I don't know what I can do except to have those conversations, like well, of, of the whys, why why people feel the way they feel. They're, they're tough conversations. It's not easy. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, we can we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, other things that you can do, like, first off, I want to say that's tremendous. Um, and you're not always going to get a reaction that's positive when you do seek to show that you care. Sometimes you're going to get some negativity because people are going to feel like you should mind your own business and leave them alone. You will get that, but you'll also be able to form relationships and friendships. And if this woman really needs something, you might be able to help her with that. Um, right. Another thing you can do is having, and that's what's on this slide, um, having tough conversations with your racist, homophobic, whatever friends and family that are going around spewing hate. That's, you know, when, when everything happened with George Floyd and people were, you know, realizing that, wow, you know, there really might be racism still in this country. A bunch of my colleagues reached out to me and I mean, they're checking in with me tearfully because they're in shock that our country is in the state that it's in. And my response is very neutral because I'm like, I've experienced racism since I was, you know, four years old that I can remember. So this isn't new to me and I am, thriving within it and I'm living within it. So I said, rather than calling me and expressing yourself and you giving me your tears, call your uncle, call your neighbor, call somebody else who is spreading again th these hateful things and address them, you know, use your superpower. So it sounds like you're using your superpower. You can go beyond that. You can, 
Um, it, happens in voting, it happens in writing politicians and letting them know what your concerns are as it faces um, transgender, LGBTQ, people at the margins. So, um, so the best practices here. We're gonna understand that we've been socialized into a racist system within American society. You, you, have to accept, you have to accept that for this to work. If you don't, I don't know where you go from there. Um, and the process of unlearning is major and it's a lifelong practice. Being able to say, and I don't know, I, I'm not forcing anybody here, but being able to say black lives matter because all lives matter cannot until the black ones, the ones at the margins, the ones that are being taken do too and really understand what that means. Um, having the, again, those tough conversations with friends and family, be careful. I, I have to put a warning on that as well. Like you're putting yourself at risk then. They may not wanna to talk to you anymore. They might yell at you, scream at you, curse you. Um, be actively and intentionally anti-racist, anti-homophobic, anti-misogynistic. I think I've said that enough. So being active about that is that critical thinking piece of understanding and assessing as you're going through life. Why are people experiencing the things that they're experiencing around you and what you can do to help with that? Provide continued cultural competence education as a requirement for staff and leadership. So kudos to you, Rick, for bringing me in. Even if I am different from everyone else's thought on the call, it's still an educational piece. You'll still take something from this and run with it and do and do well. Um, this will help to leverage difference in a way that will elevate your staff, your team to understand that the infusion of diverse experience truly echoes the values of the institution. And with what, what you all do, it definitely does. You all took an oath for, you know, to help folks. So this helps you to help them better. Diversify your organization at every level. Diversity, again, does not mean having, you know, a couple people of color and one woman in low ranking positions within your organization while the leadership is all white and male. A couple more, listen to the voices of marginalized people as, as you were just sharing, listening to this young woman from Baltimore and hearing what her concerns are and how you can assist her. So listening to those voices within your community, your team, your employees, and give them seats at the table for discussion, um, sorry, for decision-making and to hear them. Allow people of color to lead. Pull your employees and find out what you're doing well in areas um, and areas that you need to improve upon, use the data to make changes. Do not rely on people of color or marginalized people to educate your organization. It is not their job. Don't pick the one person that you have and say, Danielle, well, you can with me, but so we'll say, Joanne, tell me why all, you know, Hispanic women from wherever do this don't do that <laughs> don't do that unless you have a personal relationship with her where she can tell you about yourself um if if you're out of line hire somebody to come in and have these tough conversations include diversity and belonging questions in your hiring process um i was interviewing for a women's soccer coach position and everyone i asked them all the same questions like how does inclusivity and diversity uh, play a role in your program? And some folks had phenomenal answers. They were like, oh my goodness, diversity of thought. Like when I hire my staff, um, I have to make sure that I have representation in these areas because I think it's so robust and it just helps my program so much. And then others were like, I, I don't have a problem with diversity people. I've never had a problem with diversity people. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I don't know that there could be a worse answer. Um, it just, it adds to the negativity of things. So uh, make sure uh, you have a diverse slate of candidates in the hiring practices, which is very challenging. I mean, I had very few women apply for a women's coaching position. They're coaching females, but that is kind of the state of collegiate athletics at this, this level. We just didn't have a bunch and I searched high and low. Um, as leaders, you can become an accomplice to diversity and inclusion efforts. Uh, here's where you can rectify pay gaps and make sure that you're using your powers to balance the scale. So that's for the people who write our checks, I imagine, for this group. Uh, we wanna think critically before we speak 
and about the word choices and who our audience is. That is that is the most important piece here. Thinking before it comes out of your mouth. Um, or thinking before you reach to touch someone. So I also, I got another hair story. I had long um, micro braids and I was finishing a run uh, in right outside of DC. It was crazy hot. I was foolish to even take that run. I got back to the hotel. I'm soaking sweaty, disgusting. You wouldn't have wanted to get on the elevator with me. And this couple gets on the elevator with me. I'm like bent over. I stand up to be polite because I'm in the elevator now with other people. And this woman just runs her fingers through my hair. Her husband had to grab her hand and say, you can't do that. And she goes, oh, but it's just so beautiful. So she thinks she's complimenting me when she's actually touching me, which you know, was not invited. So these things happen again and again and again. Okay, so the change starts with us, starts with you. It's okay to be wrong. Again, like when you're working and you come into those situations where you're gonna have those gender questions, like you're gonna be wrong sometimes, that's okay. Be wrong, learn from the mistakes, treat everyone as was suggested with kindness uh, and respect and it'll take you a long way. And other times it's not gonna matter and the, the person's not gonna care and they're gonna be mean to you and they're in pain and whatever. So if comfortable, you can share your pronouns. If you have email, correspondence with one another. If it's not for you, you know, it's for others. And if you don't want to do it, that's fine also. Um, and then I just pulled this piece up so we could talk a bit more about this. So this is, I don't know if this is your code specifically, um, but I pulled it off, off the internet. And the part that spoke to me the most is you solemnly pledge um, to follow the following code, to conserve life, alleviate suffering, promote health, do no harm, and encourage the quality and, and equal availability of medical care. Um, that's a copy and paste. So with all of those pieces, you know, it doesn't say to people who look like me or people who go to my church or people who um, are the same, have the same lifestyle that I do. You know, that's everyone. Um, and then I was doing a little bit of research about dealing with, um, I shouldn't use the word dealing, about interacting with tra tra transgender folks. And from the research, it was indicated that creating a safe space and affirming environment for all patients by knowing and calling patients by their preferred names and pronouns is something that is being taught in your field right now. Um, so while, again, while this person may have male anatomy and they want to be called Roberta, you need to call them Roberta, but on your side of things, on the paperwork side of things, you need to indicate that this, this uh, that Roberta has male anatomy. Um, so I wanted to check in with you all on goals. Did we maintain an open and growth mindset? I don't know, you all can tell me. Did you learn something new? Did you engage with each other a little bit? But I guess it's a, it's a small group. Did you challenge your meaning making? Did you critically assess, assess what you accept as okay, standard or normal? Did you lead with the best practice? Did you contribute to a solution? Did you find your superpower? So I'll be quiet for a moment and let you all speak. Did you gain anything? That's what I want to know. I, I could say I definitely learned some things. And I definitely gained some knowledge. I, the gaslighting thing was definitely uh, a very good explanation and that it really puts a lot of today's politics into play for me you know like it, it helps me understand all that a little bit better absolutely um i'm gonna see if i can stop my screen share so i can come back stop screen sharing okay so i can come back because i think there's stuff in the chat perhaps but i'm, I'm happy that you gained some some knowledge regarding um gaslighting 
and and the role that that plays it's it's so important nowadays to really again critically think about you know what we experience while we're watching the news while we're talking with friends um and i have friends that are extremists in all different directions and the ones that have opposing views to mine they enjoy having conversations with me because I make them think about things differently. And I enjoy having conversations with them so that I can know what's going on um, with people who think differently from me and have not even different values over time, but more so like, more so like different places in life. Um, and, and what gets them to where, you know, they're interested in, in thinking differently. Okay, I think I found some questions. Um, so Jackie, I'm looking at your 827 post. I will tell people not that you're not there to judge, but to provide the best, yeah, the best possible care that you can, absolutely. And I know that's probably not easy. Did anyone else wanna speak, Greg or Nate or Rick? I'm reading Jackie's comments, so I don't wanna overpower any thoughts. Jackie uh, further asked um, if she could get a copy of your slides. Um, that way she could review the definitions and best practices. Um, uh, Greg uh, says, yes, it was good. I like different views. Uh, Jackie has a question regarding your, your thoughts on mental health issues and recent events in Lancaster County. Um, let me see her comment. Okay. So Daniel, so if Jackie, um, gives me her email, I will send her the definitions. Um, okay. Daniel, going back to your, your black lives matter. What is your take on the thought of people saying recently that since all lives matter, are people not being racist singling out blacks as opposed to those of other nationalities, races in the U S Asians, Muslims, um, well, the longest history of oppression in the US is to the black body. So again, as I was saying before, the purpose of saying black lives matter is not to say that white lives or Asian lives do not matter or Hispanic lives, if we wanna break it down like that. It's drawing attention to say, we matter, stop killing us. And that's why saying all lives matter is simply undercutting or attempting to gaslight folks that are saying black lives matter because the reason that they're saying it is because they are the ones that are in danger and being eliminated. Um, so I'm not sure about the nationalities and races in the US piece. Um, let me see if she wrote anything further. Rick, were you gonna speak? I'm sorry, what's that? Oh, I was just, I thought I was interrupting you. Any comments on mental health issues and recent events in Lancaster County? I do not have enough information to speak. And I would actually feel like um, you all would be providing me information about mental health issues. And I think you're referring to a young man who might have been violent and then he ended up being killed. He ended up being shot um, because he was a threat. Um, I don't know how that all plays a part. I feel like mental health in our country is not handled well. And this is my personal opinion. There's no data backing this. Oftentimes I feel like people with mental health issues, instead of them being, um, cared for, they're put in jail. Um, and that is like how they are taken away from society. Um, so I, I'm not sure. I think what I would also add to the comment about mental health issues and recent events um, in Lancaster County is the discussion of police reform and how we are gonna go about retraining uh, police to interact with citizens in general, but then specifically citizens that have mental health issues. But that's a whole nother conversation. Thank you, Gregory, for your input. Um, Okay, so we ended a bit early, but you all didn't participate a whole lot. Sandra helped me out a bit. 
Can I answer any questions um, at this time other than the ones that Jackie put in the chat? And did anyone want to share anything like what they learned new or anything like that? I I sort of have so if if you were doing some sort of team building exercise, um, that video that you that the video that you sent that you showed us taking steps forward and back privilege walk yep. The privilege walk is that just like YouTube privilege walk? Yeah, you can you can um, look up privilege walk. Privilege walk. There's a way to do it online now. Um, I actually pulled that up when we were getting started to see if we would really do it together, and I hadn't tried it out before, so I wasn't interested in, in trying to figure it out on the fly. Um, but you could Google privilege walk. You could see that video. And if you want to do it um, with a, a team building group, there are questions that can be created for you or um, you can come up with them on your own. And I mean, I think they cover a lot of areas that are of concern um, that kind of make us different. Um, and, and some of those areas of concern affect generational wealth and growth. So those those pieces of privilege, you know, the, the kid in the front was like, I didn't realize, you know, I had all of these privileges. It feels bad looking back at some of my, you know, colleagues or friends or whatever, but that's real. And I think oftentimes we don't take the time to think about, you know, what we have that others around us don't have and how that is not necessarily fair, which gets me into my radical stuff when we talk about equity. Um, and people want to help and people want to address systemic racism. But the other piece of that is giving up something that you have. And to give up something that you have for equity is where people draw the line. Like they, they want everyone to be treated fairly, but if that's going to reduce the value of their house or if that's going to change the school that their kids go to, they're not interested in, in it anymore. So people want to wear the T-shirt that says, you know, Black lives matter or, you know, gay lives matter or whatever. But when it's time to actually uh, put the rubber to the road, that's when things change. So, well, I, I guess we'll be ending a bit early. Uh, is there anything more, uh, Rick, that you need from me or anything more, any questions that folks want to have? Um, Jackie, did you put your email or if you're not, comfortable putting your email. Oh, I see more stuff from you now. Just on how we respond to people with Black Lives Matter issue. I know there has been targets of Asians. Yeah, there's there's Asian hate stuff going on as well. Um, so Jackie, what I can do, I can put my email and then you can email me. And then I can get you the definitions and best practices. Oh, okay. I see it. Where's my phone? I don't know how this works, so I don't want to. I'll take a picture. You have a crumb. That's that's an old person move right there. Yes, I'm gaslighting. That you <laughs> taking a screenshot. If you would just hit Control and Print Screen, you would be able to take a screenshot of that. And um, and it's, it's the same thing. <laughs> you just did it with your phone. That's you taking yeah. a picture of a picture. I'm well. I'm taking a picture of you that. Know, Jack call, one of, call one of your kids. They'll take care of it. <laughs> Listen, I'm not that old, but listen, that's that's the. You did the, tell the, us how old you were, so. Um, I, I I know, but that's okay. You realize that the I followed your career. I know how old you are. <laughs> hey, just so you know, our kids are referring to. Hey, Rick, I'm old. I don't appreciate hundreds. it. <laughs> All right, now I got some people helping me out. Thank you. So you two use your superpowers to to protect me against Rick making fun of me I'm for not being old. Fun. <laughs> it's all good. Rick's over there. He does the same thing. He's got to have his readers on to find his readers. Listen, some people can't even. Negative. Negative, Rick. 
Oh, that's right. That's right. You got you got your AARP card. You got the the, the half off your LASIX. Uh, uh, uh. Hey, I have had to my AARP card for years. Doesn't give me any discounts. It stinks. <laughs> Our, oh, Jackie's got a flip phone. Ooh. All right. So yeah, it takes all all types. All right. um, open mindset. We're all learning. And sometimes we're wrong and we'll just figure it out. Um, that, that is what I will leave you all with <laughs> for the evening. Um, thank you for your time. I would love to come back if you wanna go deeper into any of the issues that we started to talk about. This was kind of a overall approach. So if you wanted to target uh, to, for me to do a little bit of research on mental health, um, I'd be happy to do that. Or any, anything else under the sun pretty much you know, diversity, bias, all those types of things. They can go in so many different directions. And lastly, I want to say that I, again, appreciate all that you folks do, saving lives, you're on the front line, making it happen. Um, that is commendable and awesome work. And, and, and don't forget, Danielle, you're always welcome to come down and do a ride along with us. Um, if you want to come out and, and, and see what it's like on the front lines, I have two supervisors in our discussion tonight. Nate is a Lieutenant, uh, Greg's a captain. So we could, we could set you up on some, uh, you know, to, to, to have that experience. Cause again, as a, you know, as your, you know, masters in education, we all know that, you know, experiential learning is the best way to learn anything. Absolutely. I, I would love that. Um, I'm going to take you up on that. I never even thought that that was a possibility. Sure. And that would help me. You know, again, I would be learning. So. Yeah. I will. Uh, of course, if you want to see people work in your gas, um, tomorrow, tomorrow, I, I will send you a um, observer form. Okay. And I will get you in contact with our scheduler, Tina, and she'll be able to fill, facilitate for you, facilitate that for you at your, uh, at your uh, convenience. Okay. That would be tremendous. And if you want to ride with Greg and Nate, they both ride on the trucks. If you want to do that, since you um, have had, you know, a little uh, FaceTime or, uh, you know, verbal time with them, we can certainly arrange that as well. Sure. Whatever works. I I'm down to, to experience uh, so some of it. <laughs> no, there's no some. There, there, it's like it's all or nothing. There, it's all or nothing. Yes. I'm CPR certified, I think. Oh, there you go. Oh, Nate, good. Greg, we got her. You would actually probably be amazed how boring this job actually is at times. I could, well, I imagine like it's a whole lot of downtime until you're on, and then it's like chaos. It actually, uh, Danielle, um, I Sandy's like one of my idols now. She just got hired here a couple months ago, but she's she was an old timer here. But Sandy has it. If you've if you've never seen the movie um, Bringing Out the Dead, it was a 1999 movie by Martin Scorsese. Nicholas Cage, and it follows a paramedic around Hell's Kitchen in New York. Uh, Nick Cage rode with Sandy up when she was with the FDNY. So if you ever want to watch it, again, it, it's cinema. So it, it's some people think it's a little overboard, but I think for what, you know, to teach people what EMS is like in the front lines on 911, that is a great in real life view. I mean, Scorsese is a wonderful director, but it gives you a, probably one of the most visceral views of what a um, healthcare professional, pre-hospital healthcare professional has to deal with. And Sandy's in it? No, Sandy did the- No. Oh, Sandy, where No, no. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. Okay, I, okay. I have friends that were in, uh, you remember the show NYPD Blue? Uh-huh. Um, they used real EMS in that too. My friend Rita D'Amato was the, um, in that first episode, she played the EMT when she shakes her head and says, he's gone. <laughs> so, so ridiculous. <laughs> no, I'm definitely going to check it out. Um, I probably have seen it now that I think about it, but, um, no, I, I definitely think you all have other superpowers, um, than you know mentioned in the presentation because you're saving lives like that is that is commendable. All right. You know if 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 you, just as as from a um, a a needed 
for infrastructure of any city, you need a pre-hospital care system, right? I, I, and it's part of the emergency services. So if you look at all the uniform services in New York City or any city, it's uh, sanitation, police, fire, and the EMS is always on the back burner. And if you take all those organizations, the most diverse crowd of people of employment will be EMS tenfold. We have the most women, people of color, people of everything. In New York, I work for transvestites, transgender, sex, every, I mean, and even here in Lancaster. So, it, you know, it really doesn't matter where you are. Yeah. EMS is the most diverse organization, I think, probably in the country, anywhere, for that matter, anywhere. It, it's, that's what they attract. It, it, you know, it, that's what it attracts. Whereas police and fire, it's very specific, you know, and, and it's, 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 it's very different. EMS is, has always been a very diverse, and maybe the guys, the guy, I mean, these guys have more years than me. Uh, Greg has more years than me, and, and, you know, he could probably attest to that. But it is the most diverse uh, organization, I think, anyway. Okay. Um, the, I, I did a little bit of research just to try and find out like what you all might be experiencing and hearing about, but it was few and far between. Um, there were concerns just again about like the language in talking with people that are transgender. And that was like a more recent study just because that's, that's newer. And then there were few and far between um, just uh, I guess rogue EMTs that were like torturing or hurting specific um, groups at the margins because of whatever problem they had with them. I think I read an article about a white supremacist who got, um, I don't even know what it's called when you're not allowed to treat anymore, but he was caught torturing a child with a needle or something like that. So I want to bring that up as part of the presentation, but I found it interesting that, you know, from a, from a data standpoint, there were fewer instances than I thought that there would be, because I think you have to have a good heart to get into this, but your heart probably gets pulled in a variety of directions when you see the things that you see. Um, so, yeah. You're right. Yeah. All right. So, um, Danielle, I just emailed you that application. So if you have All right. any questions, Thank you. let me know. I sent it to your uh, pro coach, Coach Pro Flow. Um, okay. So, all right, everybody, if no one has any other questions or comments, um, I'm going to stop the recording here and we're going to let everybody have a good Thursday night. Uh, please note August. Um, August training has not been uh, finalized yet. I'm still waiting to hear back from um, some people on that. So uh, as soon as I am able to finalize that, I'll send out a flyer as I normally do. Um, until then, please be safe. Drink. Um, hydrate.